Methods of science. Warm up. We use science every day without even realizing it. Read these questions related to science. Then open the notebook tool and record your answers. What exactly is science? Write the definition of science in your own words. Write one question that a scientific experiment could answer. All right, so the note components over here. I like to copy and paste the questions. And what exactly is science? My definition, science is the study of how or why things happen. A question that a scientific experiment could answer would be, would more of my students turn in their work if they got paid per assignment? Hi, I'm Brianna, and I work as a conservation specialist. I wake up early for work, and every morning I hear the sound of chirping birds. That's when I realize that Earth is a unique planet in the solar system. It's the only planet that has life. From the moment you get up until you go to bed at night, you come across many different organisms. You may see people walking their dogs in the park or insects crawling along the road. You see life just about everywhere you go. Life scientists like me study these living organisms. Some scientists study animals, while others study microorganisms. I love to study plants and the conditions that they thrive in. I conduct experiments on different plant species. I research the climatic conditions that help them grow, their flowering season, and how they reproduce. The most fascinating aspect to my research is studying whether plants have any medicinal uses. So, what's the process for conducting experiments on living things? Do scientists follow a different method for studying living things than for non living things? In this lesson, you'll learn the steps to scientific investigation. How to think scientifically, and some of the units of measurement that you'll use in this course. Scientific inquiry. You might think that science is a subject that you learn about only in school, but when you look around, you'll see that people use science every day. For example, baking cookies in the oven or speaking to a friend on the phone both involve science. Science is the study of natural events and processes. When we use the term natural, we mean that the relationship, thing, or process occurs on its own. It's not made by people. Science has many different branches of study. Earth and space science involves the study of planets, moons, and other bodies in the universe. Chemistry involves the interactions between different substances under different conditions, such as pressure and temperature. Life science is the study of living organisms. It also involves the relationships between living organisms and non living things. You may have noticed that your nose is shaped differently than a relative's nose, or you may have wondered how your doctor knows the exact cause of your illness. The answers to such observations and questions come from studying life science. The scientific method scientists research a wide variety of topics. To reach a conclusion in their area of interest, they follow a series of steps. Some scientists study cells in the human body. Other scientists research new stars millions of miles away. Whatever topic scientists study, they follow a common process called the scientific method. Watch this video to understand how scientists conduct experiments using the scientific method. The scientific method in an approach. To investigation that consists of a series of steps, questions, hypothesis, collection of, sorry, collection and analysis of data, explanation, conclusion, and communication. This is a nose spray that my daughter uses. Ellen Bass has a family full of allergies. Her daughter Melanie. I'm always like stuffed and like always blowing my nose. Her son Ian. I sneeze, I cough. That's why Ellen's obsessed with keeping every room free of dust and mold. How often is this house being cleaned? Five days a week. 
But germ experts say hidden inside family homes like this one are colonies of nasty allergens thriving in the most unlikely of places, the pillows on your bed. I've seen people who had pillows loaded with microorganisms. Microbiologist Dr. Philip Tierno says as pillows absorb germs from our skin in the air, they become a breeding ground for mold, bacteria, and dust mites. So inside our pillows, we have a lot more than just uh, some stuffing, some down. That's correct. Some gross stuff. It's literal zoo. And the older your pillows, the more likely they're contaminated. The Bass family hasn't replaced their pillows in eight years. It just makes me sick. It makes me feel dirty. <laughs> it really does. It makes me feel dirty. To find out what was lurking inside their pillows, we bagged them up and took them to Dr. Tierno's lab, where he tested each one for fungus and bacteria. His results could cause any family to lose some sleep. What did you find in the kids' pillows? On all the kids' pillows, I found uh, fungal mold. And Dr. Tierno says this is what they're inhaling every time their heads hit the pillow. Melanie said that she has really bad allergies. Are these playing a role in those allergies? Probably. On the parents' pillows, he found lots of bacteria, a possible sign of creepy critters. I would say from this, probably all of them have dust mites. Uh. We shared the results with Ellen and her kids. So what do you think of your pillow? I think that's disgusting that I actually slept on that. I just feel nauseous because I've taken her to allergists and, and doctors for her allergies and all this stuff in the meantime is, is growing in her pillow that she's sleeping on. So how do you protect yourself? Dr. Tierno says it's simple. Use an allergen proof cover like this one on every bed pillow. What's out of the pillow can't get into the pillow. What's in the pillow cannot get out of the pillow in your face. Try that out. To help them breathe easier, we gave the Bass family brand new pillows, each with its own protector. It's comfortable. It's like really thick and fluffy. Are you going to sleep better knowing that those yucky pillows are out of the house? Oh my God, totally. To see those Petri dishes and my kids are breathing that in every day, it's, it's really an eye opener. Directions, read the instructions for this self-checked activity, type in your response to each question, and check your answers. At the end of the activity, write a brief evaluation of your work. Activity. In this activity, you'll answer questions about, or based on the video you watched about allergy-causing germs found in pillows. Scientific investigation starts with an observation of a natural phenomenon or problem. What observation prompted the family to conduct a scientific investigation? The kids had allergy systems, symptoms, sorry, even though the house was kept clean. Part B, scientific experiments answer questions. When Dr. Philip Torino, Torino conducted his experiment on the pillows, what question was he trying to answer? He wanted to know if there was something on the pillows that was contributing to the children's allergies. How did Dr. Tierno find the answer to his question? He tested the pillows for signs of microorganisms. He took samples from the pillow, then he grew the microorganisms in a petri dish. What were the results of the experiment? There were many different microorganisms on the pillows. Dr. Tierno stated that these germs were probably causing the kids to have the allergy symptoms. The results of an experiment often prompt new questions that further scientific investigation can answer. From the results of this experiment, name one question that a new experiment could answer. My, the, the experiment, a new experiment could be, would an allergy blocking pillow cover reduce the symptoms? Why do you think this experiment fits in the category of life science? 
So again, just for your own, I like to take part of the question, type it into the answer box. I think this experiment fits the category of life science because life science is the study of living things, children, and microorganisms are living things. The activity started with an observation. Observation is the first step in the scientific method. Let's use an experiment to look at the steps in the scientific method. Open this chart and track each step as we go through the process. Make observations. The first step in the scientific method is observation. Scientists conduct experiments based on the phenomena they see in their surroundings. Observation prompts them to begin an investigation. Let's say that Mary has two identical plants in different locations. One is in the sun, and the other is in the shade. Mary observes that the plant in the sun is taller than the plant in the shade. This observation prompts her to conduct a scientific investigation about whether plants need sunlight to grow. Ask questions. The next step in the scientific method is to ask questions. Though any type of question is good, be sure that you can perform a test based on the questions. The answers should also be able to measure output. Mary's question is, do plants need sunlight to grow? You can answer this question using measurable data because you can measure a plant's height with a ruler. So this is a valid question for the experiment. Data is faxed, collected for reference and analysis. Construct a hypothesis. A hypothesis is a possible explanation for why something occurs. The experiment should be able to prove whether the hypothesis is true or false. Scientists use hypotheses to make predictions about the results of their experiments. So, Mary's hypothesis is that the plant needs sunlight to grow. Using this hypothesis, she predicts that if she puts the plant in a place with no sunlight, the plant will not grow. Test the hypothesis. The next step is to test the hypothesis. Mary needs to design an experiment with several factors that could affect the results. A good experiment controls as many factors as possible so that a single factor can be tested. This factor, called the variable, changes its value several times when performing the experiment. Controlling the experiment ensures that the testable variable causes the change observed in the experiment. Mary hypothesized that plant growth depends on sunlight. To test the hypothesis, she takes these steps. 1. She buys two of the same type of plant with the same height. Before starting the experiment, she measures the plant's height with a ruler. 2. She puts one plant in a glass box and the other plant in a wooden box. 3. She places the boxes near each other. 4. Two weeks later, she measures the height of the plants and records her observations. 5. Mary observes that the plant in the glass box is healthy and has doubled in height. The plant in the wooden box did not grow at all. Mary considers the boxes to be the testable variable. Each box affects the plant's growth differently. The wooden box doesn't let in sunlight. The sun, water, and temperature are constant values. Mary considers them constant values because the plant receives these factors every day. Analyze the results. An experiment doesn't always give the same results as the hypothesis. Because science relies on facts, scientists repeat tests to verify the results. A hypothesis is accurate only when other scientists get the same results by repeating the experiment several times. If the experiment can't verify the original hypothesis, scientists may modify the hypothesis and retest it. Repeat or retest. 
Because Mary's first trial supported her hypothesis, she decided to repeat the experiment two more times with new plants. She saw the same results both times. Conclude. After scientists complete their experiments and make any necessary changes to the hypothesis, they collect the results. Then they analyze the results and form a conclusion. Based on the results of her experiment, Mary concluded that plants need sunlight to grow. Make observations. Ask questions. Construct a hypothesis. Test hypothesis with an experiment. Analyze the results. Repeat the process. Construct a hypothesis. Test the hypothesis with an experiment. Analyze the results. Do that another time. And then conclude and communicate the results. Communicate the results. Science is a collection of facts. Scientists prove these facts by conducting experiments and publishing results in scientific journals. These results help other scientists to modify or repeat an experiment to better understand a phenomenon. Mary is a student, so she took her results to her science class. Using these results, her teacher and her classmates performed the experiment on other plants. In this way, they could check if Mary's hypothesis was true for other plants, too. Type your response in the box. After her sunlight experiment, Mary observes that the plants in her garden grow when she waters the soil. She wonders if the plants would grow with the same amount of water but no soil. Using the steps of the scientific method, explain how Mary would conduct a science experiment to test whether plants need soil to grow. So the first step is to make an observation. So we observed, or Mary observed, that plants in her garden grow when she waters the soil. Ask questions. She wonders if the plant would grow with the same amount of water but no soil. Oops. Construct the hypothesis and make predictions. Mary hypothesized that plants need only water to grow, but not soil. So she predicted that a plant put in water instead of soil would still grow. Test the hypothesis. She put, she put two identical plants in two different boxes, one box with soil and one box with water. Then she placed them in the same amount of sunlight. She added the same amount of water to both boxes each week. Finally, she measured the height of both plants at the start and the end of the experiment. Notice she controlled the amount of sunlight she controlled the amount of water. The thing that was different was whether one had soil or one did not have soil. Last, analyze the results and make conclusion. At the end of two weeks, Mary measured both plants to determine if they grew. The plant with water grew less than the plant with soil. She concluded that plants need soil, water, and sunlight to grow. Soil contains essential nutrients. When the plant receives sunlight, the water carries these nutrients to various parts of the plant, allowing the plant to grow. You've seen the steps in a scientific investigation. Now open the notebook tool and look at your answer to this question from the warm-up. What exactly is science? Write the definition of science in your own words. Now that you've learned about the scientific method, can you write a better definition of science? Thinking scientifically. A hypothesis is the basis of any experiment that scientists perform. Once an experiment is proven true, it becomes a scientific theory. People generally use the term theory to give their own explanations for what they see. 
A scientific theory, however, is an explanation of observations by scientists when they repeatedly conduct experiments. Before a hypothesis becomes a scientific theory, scientists test and retest the experiment many times. A scientific law, on the other hand, describes a repeated pattern in nature. It is a universal fact. For example, gravity is a scientific law because it has a predictable pattern in nature. Every time you drop an object, you can predict that it will fall. The object falls because of the force of gravity. Scientific questions. An important part of science is asking questions, but keep in mind that science can't answer all questions. The answer to a scientific question should be in the form of data that you can test or measure. In the summary, it asks which type of questions would be scientific questions versus non-scientific questions. Here are some examples. Does cutting down trees decrease the number of squirrels in the area? Squirrels. Does the new flu vaccine reduce the number of people who get sick with the flu each year? On the other hand, science can't answer questions based on people's feelings or values. Science also can't answer questions that are based on a person's opinion. These questions aren't bad to ask, but science can't answer them. Consider these examples: Is it ethical to pollute the environment? What is the prettiest dress in this shop? Drag each label to the correct location. A group of scientists are conducting a scientific investigation about animals and plants that live in the desert. Identify which questions are scientific and which are not. Is it wrong? Key giveaway: There is wrong to build roads where desert animals live. Wrong is a statement of opinion. Whether something is right or wrong depends on your own values and perspective. Should should people be afraid of snakes? Well, should is also a judgment call. Is the desert sunset pretty? Pretty. And、uh, a sunset. Well, the answer is yes, but the it's asking for an opinion. Some people may not like sunsets. Scientific questions, however, does a higher number of snakes in the desert decrease the number of mice in the desert carrying capacity? Are desert plants influenced by pollution? On average, how hot does the desert get in the summer? I think it depends on where at, because in Death Valley, reading be scientific information,、Dang. we come across a variety of information every day. But not everything that we read or hear is necessarily true. You've probably heard the word skeptic to describe a person who often disagrees with other people. However, in science, it is important to be skeptical. For instance, when you watch an advertisement for a product you want to buy, you probably don't believe everything the advertisement says about the product. You can verify the claims by asking friends who have already bought the product, or you can check reviews of the product to see how useful it is. Double checking the claims is important because the manufacturer wants to highlight only the product's good features in advertisements. Now, this is a perfect example of cross-curriculum concepts. What do I mean by that? I mean in health, we've already talked about. Trying to verify whether the claims being made by a product is are are they correct or not? So if it says will reduce wrinkles by twenty percent, so how is that measured? Is it accurate or is it、uh, false? Just as you check the facts before buying a product. Scientists use skeptical thinking when reading scientific data. Scientific data relies on facts and measurable data, so it's not biased. not biased. However, journalists and other people who write about science may be biased. Their opinions may be right or wrong, and may be based on what a person feels rather than on scientific data. So, articles that seem scientific may not be scientifically accurate. How do you determine if an article is scientifically accurate? Ask yourself these questions: Does the writer back up the facts with evidence? 
Is the author stating an opinion or a fact? Is the author a scientific expert in the field? Does the writer have a bias? Do other credible sources support the claims in the article? By asking these questions, you'll get a fair idea about the article's accuracy. Reviewing a scientific article. This activity will help you meet these educational goals. You will read a scientific article and review it using critical thinking. Ouch! You will cite evidence to support your analysis of a science text. Cite evidence. We can't just say this is true. We have to cite our evidence. Read each. Read the instructions for the self-checked activity. Type in your response to each question and check your answers. At the end of the activity, write a brief evaluation of your work. Activity. Read this article about the healing powers of honey and then answer the following questions. Click. Healing honey. Cough medicines don't work and they sh can have unpleasant side effects. Doctors are starting to recommend honey instead. By Emily Son, February 6, 2008. Cough, sniffles, sneezes, runny noses, colds, and other nasty lung infections are especially common in winter. To fight the misery, many people swallow syrups and pills to claim, sorry, that claim to clear stuffy noses, throat, sore throats, sniffle, stifle, coughs, and improve sleep. Growing evidence, however, suggests that these medicines don't really work. What's worse, they can have unpleasant, even dangerous side effects, especially for young children. That's why some doctors are now recommending an ancient remedy for their coughing pa patients, honey. Honey might be good for more than just sweetening foods and beverages. It's the kind of advice you might expect from your grandmother, but a new study suggests that the sticky sweet stuff might have real healing power. Honey has been used for centuries in folk remedies by cultures all over the world, says Ian Paul, a pediatrician in Pennsylvania State University Children's Hospital in Hershey, Pennsylvania. We thought it would be reasonable to test it. So observation. People are sick and medicines appear, don't appear to be working. Stubborn coughs. Paul was motivated to test the honey because treating coughs in children has recently become a sticky subject. Coughing is the body's way of clearing irritated airways to help you breathe, but too much coughing can irritate your lungs and throat even more. Hacking away can also make it tough to get the sleep your body needs to heal. Hoping to ease the suffering of their children, parents often give them cough medicine. Parents are often desperate to ease the suffering of their sick kids. The CDC, Public Health Image Library. These drugs have been around for decades and their manufacturers claim that they help kids feel better. But there have never been any good studies showing they work. Studies, not studies. Paul says, In 1997, the American Academy of Pediatrics even warned that codeine and dextromethorphan DM, you might have heard of Robitussin DM, not in your DMs, you know, like on Insta, but dextromethorphan. Two of the four most common ingredients, is, ingredients in cough medicines. They did nothing for young children. Codeine and DM are supposed to work by blocking messages from the brain that tell the body to cough. Hmm. A drug that doesn't work is bad enough. But cough and cold medicines can also cause severe side effects, including drowsiness, hyperactivity, hallucinations, headaches, vomiting, rapid heart rate, and worse. Hundreds of kids end up in the hospital each year, and some even die, after receiving too much cough medicine by mistake. 
please note that a musician that is talking about codeine or other types of cough syrup components in drinks as a way to uh, take drugs, essentially, um, be careful. It cannot be measured as accurately and or you could have serious side effects. Another test. Frustrated by the lack of good studies, Paul decided to do one himself. A few years ago, he and colleagues designed a test that involves 100 kids who were sick with coughs and other cold symptoms. All were between the ages of 2 and 18. The researchers divided the kids into three groups. Before bed, one group of kids took syrup that contained DM. A second group received syrup containing another common cough medicine called diphenhydramine, DPH. A third group took non-medicated syrup. In medical experience, experiments, these fake medicines are called placebos. By comparing patients who have taken a real drug with those who have taken a placebo, doctors can understand the drug's effectiveness. Neither of the researchers nor the kids and their parents knew which group was getting which syrup. Medicated syrup might not be the best solution for a cough. This is called a caption, by the way. It's captioning this, and there's the syrup iStockphoto.com. So that's a website where you can get photos and pay for them. If you don't pay for them and you reuse them as if it was your own in your own article, then you can have plagiarism. Parents answered five questions about their children's symptoms, both the night before the kids took the syrup and the night after. Results showed that the kids who swallowed non-medicated syrup improved just as much as kids who got the drugs. Paul and colleagues published those results in 2004. Last October, this was uh, in 2008, so obviously not last, last October, but, you know, around the time that you guys were babies. Um... Oops, there I am. Last October, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration reviewed all the data, including Paul's, and concluded that parents should not give cough medicines to children under six. Around the same time, drug companies stopped selling these medicines for use in young children. Sweet solution, brah. Paul knew that parents would be dismayed by the news. He felt the same way. It's hard as a doctor to tell people that medicine is no better than pl a placebo when I don't have an alternative to give them, he says. In his search for a different solution, Paul came across ancient an antidotes about honey's healing powers. Doctors in ancient Egypt for example, used to treat wounds, coughs, and joint pain thousands of years ago, used it. Paul also discovered that the World Health Organization, you might have heard of them recently, recommended honey as a throat soother, even though there was no scientific evidence of its effectiveness. Honey couldn't hurt, Paul figured. Why not find out if it could help? National Honey Board. Mmm, honey. He designed his next study with much like the first one. At bedtime, 105 sick kids took honey-flavored DM syrup, buckwheat honey syrup, or no treatment. Parents and kids in the non-treatment group knew they weren't getting anything, but the other two groups weren't told which treatment they were getting. This time, 
Sur surveys showed that kids who swallowed about tea two teaspoons of buckwheat honey before bedtime coughed less and slept better than did youngsters in the other groups. Their parents slept better too. Honey isn't safe for children younger than one year old, Paul says, but his results have convinced him to recommend it as a cough suppressant for older children. When parents want something for their kids to take, Paul says, honey seems like the best option. Why honey? Most people think that honey is a tasty substitute for sugar in their tea or as a topping on a peanut butter and banana sandwich. So what gives the sweet stuff its healing powers? For one thing, it's thick. Sticky consistency probably helps coat and soothe the throat, says Catherine Beals, a registered dietitian at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. She's also a nutrition consultant for the National Honey Board, a honey-promoting group that founded Paul's recent study. Substances called antioxidants may also be a part of the answer, Beale says. Antioxidants, which are also found in foods such as blueberries, spinach, and dark chocolate, mm -hmm, protect our cells from damage. Studies show that antioxidant levels in the body rise after someone swallows honey. All honey contains antioxidants, but certain types contain more than others. There are more than 300 types of honey, sorry, honey, Beale says. Color, flavor, and health benefits depend on which types of flowers honey-producing bees visit. Uh, most of the honey we buy in U.S. grocery stores is made by bees that visit clover plants. Darker honeys, such as the buckwheat type that Paul used in his experiment, are generally higher in antioxidants than lighter ones, including clover, Beale says. Honey has other health ad advantage. At least some types seem to kill infectious microbes. One honey from New Zealand has proved especially good at healing wounds when slathered on the skin. There is no evidence that eating honey will help prevent colds, Bill says, but if your throat is sore and you can't stop coughing, it might make you feel better, and a little dose of sweetness might just cheer you up. And then you can go deeper by clicking all that. Did you find any biases or opinions in this article? Explain your answer. So bias means you lean one side or the other. Yes, the doctor said that it was difficult to tell parents that the medicine is not very effective in treating coughs. So he had a bias or an interest in finding something that would work for his parents patients. Also, the study was funded in part by the Honey Board, so they also had an invested interest in the outcome of the study. As a scientific reviewer, which parts of the article would cause you to be skeptical of the claim that honey relieves cough better than cough medicine? The article mentions that there was only one study done that showed a benefit. According to the article, there is no previous scientific evidence that supports the statement that honey decreased coughing. So, I am skeptical whether honey really relieves coughs better than cough medicine. What types of data would scientists need to scientifically conclude that honey decreases the risks of coughing in all people? Scientists would have to perform repeated studies showing that coughing decreased in people who ate honey compared to those who did not eat honey. Scientists would need to conduct research with both kids and adults. Researching people from different age groups will help scientists prove that honey worked for most people. They would also need to determine if any other factors cause the cough, sorry, cause 
the coughing to decrease, such as the body's natural defenses against the disease or even a change in atmospheric conditions. Measurements. You can call information scientific only if you can measure it. But how do you measure something? You use tools. For example, you measure your weight on a bathroom scale. To measure how tall you have grown, you use a measuring tape. A unit of measurement is a fixed amount of a quantity. Because it's a fixed amount, we consider a unit a standard by which to measure other amounts of the same quantity. Scientific data uses several different units of measurement. The International System of Units, or the SI system, systems of measurement. In the United States, we mostly use two systems of measurement the International System of Units, SI, and the U.S. Customary System of Units. The table describes some basic U.S. customary units. For example, the length of a box is measured in inches. The volume of a bottle is measured in fluid ounces. For convenience, we use the shortened form of actual units, such as 4 FL period, OZ period for fluid ounces. Note that length is a answer on the, the sorry, the units for length is an answer on the guided notes. The units for weight is an answer. And let's see if it let me highlight it like I thought it should. The International System of Units, or the SI system, is a commonly used system of measurement around the world. Nope, it did not keep the highlighting, which is really a bummer because it's not letting me highlight it. <sighs> you can't see the answers. So, um, answers here. The length are measured, in, the units for length is inches, foot, yard, miles. The units for weight are ounce, pound, ton. And the international system units for length are kilometer, also pronounced kilometer, meter, centimeter, millimeter. The term weight is termed mass in the metrics, the international system of units. So it is kilograms, grams, and milligrams. Not the same as uh, your grams or your grandma or nana. Sorry. Okay. Temperature, we got that. Time, we got that. Elect we got all that. Okay. I'm sorry it didn't let me highlight. I don't know why it does that sometimes. I did highlight it. It deleted it. Type the correct answer in the box. Use numerals instead of words. A scientist measures the weights of two different animals. One is 250 grams. The other is 330 grams. In milligrams, what is the difference between the two weights of the animals? So the way this is explained is first find the difference in the weight of the animals. So the difference is the answer to a subtraction problem. 330 grams minus 250 grams equals 80 grams. Um, they, they have this here. I don't know if that's a typo or not. Next, convert 80 grams to milligrams. So the difference here, they added an R. The difference here is 80 grams. Convert 80 grams to milligrams. Why? Because it says in milligrams. Or up here it says in milligrams, what is the difference between the two weights of the animals? So it's telling you what you need to convert from grams to milligrams. One gram is equal to 1,000 milligrams. So 1,000 divided by one. Determine the ratio to use. So notice that this term ratio is here. That's really important because in math, we used the equivalent ratios. 
So these are the things that are constant. And so it this conversion right here is a constant. Multiply the ratio by the given value 80. So 80 times 1,000 divided by 1 equals 80,000 mg. So we went from 80 grams to 80,000 milligrams. Summary. The scientific method allows you to answer scientific questions. So, whether you're working on finding a cure for a disease or you're a student working on an experiment, you can use the scientific method to find a solution for your investigation. Last month, I designed a simple experiment to study a new plant species that my colleagues and I discovered. Based on the plant's structure, we thought the plant could live in a wide range of temperatures. We put three plants in three different rooms, a hot room, a cold room, and a room that was room temperature. At the end of each week, we measured the height of each plant. After collecting the data, we found that our prediction was incorrect. The plant in the hot room was the only one that grew. We concluded that the plant must live only in hot climates. We're now going to try additional temperature experiments. We want to narrow down the temperature in which these plants grow the tallest. In the meantime, I'm reading as much as I can about the plant. This research will help me skeptically view existing information. It'll also help me ask scientific questions related to this plant species. I need to put on my critical thinking cap. You might want to put on yours too. As you continue to learn about science, happy investigating. Congratulations, you've completed the tutorial, Methods of Science. Now, complete your guided notes, make sure you copy the link, and be prepared to take the mastery test. Best of luck to you. Study.